In his childhood, Jack has to deal with some Stephen King-style bullies who are more like psychotic killers. Damn, his ribs are broken already. But that's not enough of a straw man for this backstory, so Jack also has to deal with his father, Christian Shepherd. Yes, really. And it's going to take almost until the end of the show for someone to actually notice that. Christian tells him to his face he doesn't have what it takes to be a leader. I like to call this the Joss Whedon special, where all of a character's flaws can be traced back to having a jackass father. And this is far from the last time it'll happen either. But that's not all, as in the present day, Jack's mother sends him to bring his father back from Australia and guilt trips him about what he did. We'll find out that what he did was turn his father in for operating while drunk, which results in making this just another straw man. Look at all these always chaotic evils Jack has to deal with. He must be right! Then things just get weird as Christian isn't at his hotel and one of the employees tells Jack he was drunk last night, which Jack gets all indignant about. Because it's so unthinkable, right? Well, it turns out Christian's drunk himself to death, and I just love how the coroner feels the need to explain the term myocardial infarction to Jack. Even this guy doesn't buy that he knows anything about being a doctor. There's some issues with his flight back home, which he of course acts like a condescending dick about until the poor woman dealing with him is forced to give the baby his bottle. If this whole flashback was supposed to make me like the guy, you have failed. Charlie alerts Jack to Boone being caught in a riptide, and you've got to love this. He says he can't help because he can't swim. This from a guy we'll later learn was a champion swimmer in his childhood and will later make an impossible seeming trip to an underwater bunker. A lot of times people have told me these kinds of things can be justified by the character simply lying, but there is no such excuse here. Either the writer screwed up big time, or Charlie is morally repugnant, especially since it turns out Boone was trying to save another person who drowns. Was it worth not getting your hair wet, Charlie? Jack beats himself up a bit over the woman's death and then sees his father again, though this is a bit of a weird one. Unlike last time, there's no point where he looks away and yet the image still disappears. So what exactly did Jack see when that happened? If you assume it's consistent with later events, always a dubious prospect with this show, it's something that should have tipped him off to what's really going on much sooner than he ends up realizing it. There's an otherwise filler scene with Sawyer reading Richard Adams' classic Watership Down, which will pay off a bit later. Incidentally, it's a far better story than this, so check it out if you haven't already. Jack, Hurley, and Charlie, for some reason, find out that the water from the plane is rapidly running out. Jack again whines about how he's not going to do anything, but for once it's justified, as Charlie and Hurley just keep pestering him about it for no reason. Why they went to Jack and not Saeed about this, I have no idea. Boone is forced into the role of yet another straw man to get us on Jack's side, as he whines about being rescued and insists he could have saved the other woman. Seeing as he was at least a few feet below the surface when Jack pulled him up, it's clear just how artificial this conversation is. Bow down and worship the mighty Jack! The screenwriting gods demand it! Claire passes out from heat exhaustion, and Charlie discovers that someone took all the water. This finally gets them to put Saeed in the loop, and he scolds them for keeping all the water in one place. God, I love this guy. Locke heads out to look for a fresh water source in the interior. Jack runs into the jungle to look for his father, and ends up hanging over a cliff due to his own idiocy. Locke saves him, not seeming to notice the bubbling brook at the bottom of the cliff. Honestly, they couldn't find one location to film this that didn't have water around or CGI it out or anything? And Jack laughs afterwards because he is, after all, a jerk and an idiot, and he's just had his martyr complex validated some more. Charlie talks with Claire a bit, and surprisingly, he's not annoying at all, even when he starts going on about Locke's 400 knives, because it makes sense for the situation. It's almost enough to make you forget the whole abandoning a woman to drown thing. After Sun is spotted with water, Jin says that Sawyer gave it to them. Or he could have been pointing to that random extra in the background, but just to be safe, let's assume the guy who has main character powers. Saeed suggests they not confront him now, but wait to follow him to the rest of the water. Once again, Saeed, the man should have always been the leader. Except it turns out Sawyer traded the last of his own water to Jin for a fish. That was screen time well spent. Locke tells Jack he needs to be the leader because, um, it's really not clear. How does no one see Saeed's the man for the job? Oh, right, because Jack's the first person we saw on the show, and therefore he must be our perfect spotless hero, no matter how much evidence to the contrary we see with our own eyes. 
Locke also brings up Alice in Wonderland because, hey, random literary references in the title always make you sound smart. What if everything that happened here happened for a reason? Well, that would be nice, but we've already got one unanswered question, we'll have two more by the end of this episode, and it's going to keep building from there. So stick that in your pipe and smoke it. I've looked into the eye of this island, and what I saw was beautiful. Again, that statement doesn't quite match up with what we'll see of the man in black. He really is just talking about seeing himself, isn't he? This is where we really start seeing what was memed as the Jack face, where Matthew Fox only appears capable of showing one of two emotions, which are oddly enough both summed up perfectly in a Seinfeld clip. I mean, you're never going to be able to completely stop talking. Jerry, 94% of communication is nonverbal. Here, watch. <laughs> Uncanny, isn't it? Jack follows Christian some more and is led to a natural spring. Jack will eventually ask the man in black about this, and he'll say it was purely altruistic. The group needed water, so he led Jack to it. Except it wasn't. He actually wanted them all to die in a way that the candidates wouldn't be killed by his own hand. So letting them all dehydrate should be perfect for him. This also happens to be where the cargo hold landed, including Christian's coffin. Except he's not in it, and Jack reacts about as you'd expect, like a whining infant. And by the way, like I've said before, that's not really Christian walking around, so where'd his body go? Never explained. It turns out Boone took the water, which he says was to separate it among the camp despite his almost letting Claire die, because he dared speak against the perfect hero Jack and therefore must be vilified as much as possible. This lets Jack make his grand return and give the big hero speech. We need to start figuring things out. Yeah, good luck with that. A woman died this morning just going for a swim. And he tried to save her, and now you're about to crucify him? And he almost let another person die for no apparent reason. And like I've said before, you really should be talking to Charlie about this. He finally sums up by quoting his favorite poet, Josef Stalin. But if we can't live together, we're gonna die alone. Aye aye, comrade. Jack tells Kate about his father, leaving out the part where he was a drunk jackass. Yeah, she can probably only handle one of you right now. My score for White Rabbit is 3 out of 10. The sheer number of hoops the script has to jump through to try to make Jack sympathetic should have been a big clue to the writers that they weren't doing a very good job of making him deserving of that sympathy. I can tell when characters are being used as tools to get me to like another character, and I don't appreciate it. Though I do have to commend John Terry, who plays Christian. Before Lost, he was probably best known for the lead role in the fantasy schlockfest Hawk the Slayer, though personally, I'll always remember him as Felix Leiter from The Living Daylights. Throughout the whole show, he'll do a pretty nice job with what he's given, which is basically nothing. There's a few other filler character moments that buoy up the episode, especially the ones between Jin and Sun, but it's still not nearly enough to stop it being the first below-average episode. 